Greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, well, welcome to a new study on the New Testament, on the Gospel of Matthew, and we are in chapter 14. I know it's been a while that I came back on this, but here we are again. This is Reverend Yadi. Be loyal, be diligent, be compassionate, be courageous, be alive, and be transformed. The king's withdrawal. As I said, Matthew 14. Chapters 14 to 20, I have called the retirement of the king. During the period of time, Recorded by Matthew in these chapters, Jesus often withdrew from the crowds and spent time alone with his disciples. I will give you some scripture verses from the Gospel of Matthew. 14, verse 13, chapter 15, 21, chapter 29. No, the verses in chapter 15 are 21 and 29, and then chapter 16 is 13, and then chapter 17, the verses to 1 and 8. There were several reasons for these withdrawals. The growing hostility of his enemies, the need for physical rest, and the need to prepare his disciples for his future death on the cross. Unfortunately, the disciples were often caught up and the excitement generated by the crowds that wanted to make Jesus their king. You can look up John chapter 6, verse 15. However, we must not think that these withdrawals are periods of retirement from the crowds, where periods of inactivity. Often the crowds followed Jesus and he was unable to remain alone. He would unselfly unselfishly minister to their needs in spite of his own need for rest and attitude, and I mean solitude. In Matthew 14 to 20 in chapters, we will see these three groups of people, the Christ enemies, the needy multitude, and the disciples. As the story reaches its climax, it appears that the enemies have won, but this is not true. In the closing chapter, Matthew describes the rising king commissioning his disciples to go into all the world and share the good news with the multitude. We see the same, same three groups of people in this chapter and our Lord's responses to them. First, his enemies. Caution in chapter 14, verses 1 to 13. The Herod family looms large in the four Gospels and the book of Acts, and it is easy to confuse the various rulers. Herod the Great founded the dynasty and ruled from 37 BC to 4 BC. He was not a true Jew by birth, but was an Edomite, a descendant of Azal. He was a heathen in practice and a monster in character. He had nine wives, some say ten, and he thought nothing of slaying his own sons or wives if they got in the way of his plans. It was he who had the infants slain in Bethlehem. Herod Antipas, the Herod of this chapter, was a son of Herod the Great. His title was Tetrarch, which means ruler over the four parts of the kingdom. He ruled from 4 BC to AD 39, Anno Domino, so the Lord's day, time. And his rule was deceptive and selfish. He loved luxury and was very ambitious to become a great ruler. Herod Agrippa is the Herod who imprisoned Peter and killed James. 
you can read from this in the book of Acts chapter 12. He was a grandson of Herod the Great. Herod Agrippa II, I mean the second, was the Herod who tried Paul. Acts 25 verse 13. He was the son of the first Agrippa. All of the Herods had Edomite blood in them, and, like their ancestor Azal, they were hostile to the Jews. They practiced the Jewish religion when it helped fulfill their plans for gaining more power and wealth. Herod Antipas was guilty of gross sin. He had eloped with Herodias, the wife of his half-brother, Philip I, divorcing his one wife and sending her back to her father, the king of Petra, Leviticus 18, 16, and chapter 20, verse 21. Herod listened to the voice of the temptation and plunged himself into the terrible sin. But there were other voices that God sent to warn Herod, the voice of the prophet, verses 3 and 5. Boldly John the Baptist warned Herod and called them the, to repent. John knew that the sin of a ruler would only pollute the land and make it easier for others to sin, and that God would plunge and would judge, I mean, the sinners. Malachi 3 verse 5 We must commend John for his courage in naming sin and denouncing it. Israel was God's covenant nation and the sins of the rulers, even though they were unbelievers, would bring the chastening of God. Instead of listening to God's servant and obeying God's word, Herod arrested John and imprisoned him. John was put in the fortress of Machaerus, located about four miles east of the Dead Sea. It stood 3,500 feet above sea level, on a rocky ridge that was accessible from only one side. It was Herodias, Herod's wife, who held the grudge against John, and she influenced her husband. She plotted to have her teenage daughter perform a less civisious dance at Herod's birthday feast. Herodias knew that her husband would succumb to her daughter's charms and make some rash promises to her. She also knew that Herod would want to save face before his friends and officials. The plot worked, and John the Baptist was slain. The voice of conscience, verses 1 and 2. When Herod heard of the marvelous works of Jesus, he was sure that John had been raised from the dead. His conscience was troubling him, and neither his wife nor his friends could console him. The voice of the conscience is a powerful voice, and it can be the voice of God to those who will listen. Instead of heeding his conscience, Herod determined to kill Jesus just as he killed John. Some Pharisees, probably in on the plot, warned Jesus that Herod wanted to kill him. Luke 13, verse 31 and 32. But Jesus was not disturbed by the report. The word fox in Luke 13, 32 is feminine. Jesus said, go tell that vixen. Was he perhaps referring to Herodias, the real power behind the throne? The voice of Jesus, Luke 23, the verses 6 to 11. When he finally did meet Jesus, Herod found that the Son of God was silent to him. Herod had silenced the voice of God. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. The voice of history. Herod should have known that he could not get away with his sin. History records that Herod lost 
prestige and power. His armies were defeated by the Arabs, and his appeals to be made a king, urged by his wife, were refused by Emperor Galigula. Herod was banished to Gaul, France, and then Spain, where he died. Herod is remembered as a weak ruler whose only concern was his own pleasure and position. He did not serve the people. He served himself. He has the dubious honor of being the man who killed the greatest prophet ever sent to proclaim God's word. What was our Lord's response to the news of John's murder? Caution. He quietly withdrew from that area and went to a lonely place. He lived accordingly to a divine timetable. See John chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 7, verse 6, and verse 30. Chapter 8, verse 20, chapter 12, verses 23 and 27. Chapter 13, verse 1, chapter 17, verse 1. And he did not want to deliberately provoke trouble with Herod, because Herod's agents were all around. The Lord had to exercise wisdom and caution. And certainly Jesus was deeply moved when he heard that John had been killed. The Jewish nation permitted John to be slain because they did nothing to assist him. But these same leaders would ask for Jesus to be slain. Jesus would never permit the Jewish rulers to forget the witness of John because they rejected John's witness. They rejected their own Messiah and King. Second, the multitude, the compassion, chapter 14, the verses 14 to 21. Jesus and his disciples desperately needed rest, yet the needs of the multitude touches his heart. The word translated moved with compassion literally means to have one's inner being, vesera, steered. It is stronger than sympathy. The word is used 12 times in the Gospels, and eight of these references are to Jesus Christ. Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the needy multitude. They were like sheep that had been lacerated from brutal, fleecing, torn, exhausted, and wandering. Twice he was moved with compassion when he beheld the hungry multitude without food. In Matthew 14, verse 14, and chapter 15, verse 32. The two blind men, Matthew 20, 34, and the leper, Mark Chapter 141. Also steered his compassion as did the sorrow of the widow at Nain, Luke 7, 13. Jesus used this word in three of his parables. The king had compassion on his bankrupt servant and forgave him his debt. And we ought to forgive one another, Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. The Samaritan had compassion on the Jewish victim and cared for him in love, Luke 10, 25-37. The father had compassion on his wayward son and ran and greeted him when he came home, Luke 15, 20. If our heavenly father has such compassion toward us, should we not have compassion toward others? The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is recorded in all the four Gospels, Matthew 14, 13 to 21, Mark 6, 35 to 44, Luke 9, verses 12 to 17, and John 6, verses 4 to 13. It was definitely a miracle. Those who teach that Jesus only encouraged the people to bring out their own hidden lunches have ignored the clear statements of God's word. John 6.14 definitely calls the event a sign or miracle. Would the crowd have wanted to crown Jesus King simply because he tricked them into sharing their lunches? 
John 6, 14 to 15. Not likely. It takes little imagination to picture the embarrassing plight of the disciples. He were more than 5,000 hungry people, and they had nothing to feed them. Certainly, the disciples knew that Jesus was powerful enough to meet the need. Yet, they did not turn to him for help. Instead, they took inventory of their own food supply. A lad had five barley loaves and two fish, and their limited treasury. When they considered the time, evening, and the place a desolate place, they came to the conclusion that nothing could be done to solve the problem. Their counsel to the Lord was, send them away. How like many of God's people today, for some reason, it is never the right time or place for God to work. Jesus wanted his frustrated disciples as they tried to solve the problem, but he himself knew what he was intended to do. He wanted to teach them a lesson in faith and surrender. Note the steps you must take in solving life's problem. Start with what you have. Andrew found a lad who had a small lunch, and he brought the lad to Jesus. Was the boy willing to give up his lunch? Yes, he was. God begins where we are and uses what we have. Then, give what you have to Jesus. Jesus took the simple lunch, blessed it, and shared it. The miracle of multiplication was in his hands. Little is much if God is in it. And Jesus broke the bread and gave the pieces to the disciples. And they, in turn, fed the multitude and obey what he commands. The disciples had the people sit down as Jesus ordered. They took the broken pieces and distributed them and discovered that there was plenty for everybody. As a servant, we are distributors, not manufacturers. If we give what we have to him, he will bless it and give it back to us for us in feeding others. Conserve the results. There were twelve baskets filled with pieces of bread and fish after the people had eaten all they wanted. But these pieces were carefully collected so that nothing was wasted. I wonder how many of the pieces the lad took back home with him. Imagine his mother's amazement when the boy told the story. The Apostle John recorded his sermon on the bread of life that Jesus gave the next day in the synagogue in Capernaum, John 6, 22. The people were willing to receive the physical bread, but they would not receive the living bread. The Son of God come down from heaven. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was actually a sermon in action. Jesus is the bread of life, and only he can satisfy the spiritual hunger in man's hearts. The tragedy is, Men waste their time and money on that which is not bread. Isaiah 55 verses 1 to 7 People today are making the same mistake. Jesus still has compassion on the hungry multitudes, and he still says to his church, give them something to eat. How easy it is for us to send people away, to make excuses, to plead a lack of resources, and Jesus asked that we give him all that we have and let him use it as he sees fit. A hungry world is feeding on empty substitutes while we deprive them of the bread, the bread of life. When we give Christ what we have, we never lose. We always end up with more blessings than when we started. The third one, the disciples care and concern chapter 14 verses 22 to 36 
John recorded the reason why Jesus was in such a hurry to dismiss the crowd and send the disciples back in the boat. The crowd wanted to make Jesus king. John 6, 14-15 The Lord knew that their motives were not spiritual and that their purposes were out of God's will. If the disciples had stayed, they would certainly have fallen in with the plans of the crowd. For as yet, the disciples did not fully understand Christ's plans. They were guilty of arguing over who was the greatest, and a popular uprising would have suited them perfectly. This experience of the disciples and the storm can be an encouragement to us when we go through the storms of life. When we find ourselves in the storm, we can rest on several assurances. He brought me here. The storm came because they were in the will of God and not like Jonah, out of the will of God. Did Jesus know that the storm was coming? Certainly. Did he deliberately direct them into the storm? Yes. They were safer in the storm in God's will than on land with the crowds out of God's will. We must never judge our security on the basis of circumstances alone. As we read our Bibles, we discover that there are two kinds of storms. Storms of correction, when God disciplines us, and storms of perfection. When God helps us to grow. Jonah was in a storm because he disobeyed God and had to be corrected. The disciples were in a storm because they obeyed Christ and had to be perfected. Jesus had tested them in a storm before when he was in the boat with them. Matthew 8, verses 23 to 27. But now he tested them by being out of the boat. Many Christians have the mistaken idea that obedience to God will produce smooth sailing. But this is not true. In the world, you all shall have tribulation, Jesus promised. When we find ourselves in the storm because we have obeyed the Lord, we must remember that He brought us here and He can carry and He can care for us. He is praying for us. This entire scene is a dramatic picture of the church and the Lord today. God's people are on the sea in the midst of a storm. And yet Jesus Christ is in heaven making intercessions for us. He saw the disciples and knew their plight, just as he sees us and knows our needs. He feels the burdens that we feel and knows what we are going through. Jesus was praying for his disciples that their faith would not fail. If you knew that Jesus Christ was in the next room praying for you, would it not give you new courage to endure the storm and do his will? Of course it would. He is not in the next room, but he is in heaven, interceding for you. He sees your need, he knows your fears, and he is in control of the situation. He will come to me. Often we feel like Jesus has deserted us when we are going through the hard times of life. In the Psalms, David complained that God seemed far away and unconcerned. Yet he knew that God would ultimately rescue him. Even the great apostle Paul got into a situation so difficult he felt burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Jesus always comes to us in the storms of life. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Isaiah 43, verse 2. He may not come at the time we think he should come, because he knows when we need him the most. He waited until the ship was as far from land as possible, so that all human hope was gone. He was testing the disciples' faith, and this meant removing every human prop. Why did Jesus walk on the water? To show his disciples that the very thing they feared, the sea, was only a staircase for him to come to him? Often we fear the difficult experiences of life. 
only to discover that these experiences bring Jesus Christ closer to us. Why did they not recognize Jesus? Because they were not looking for him. Had they been waiting by faith, they would have known him immediately. Instead, they jumped to the false conclusion that the appearance was that of a ghost. Fear and faith cannot live in the same heart, for fear always blinds the eyes to the presence of the Lord. He will help me grow. This was the whole purpose of the storm, to help the disciples grow in their faith. After all, Jesus would one day leave them, and they would face many storms in their ministries. They had to learn to storm, I mean to trust him, even though he was not present with him, with them, and even though it looked as though he did not care. Now, our center of interest shifts to Peter. Before we criticize Peter for sinking, let's honor him for his man- magnificent demonstration of faith. He dared to be different. Anybody can sit in the boat and watch but it takes a person of real faith to leave the boat and walk on the water. What caused Peter to sink? His faith began to waver because he took his eyes off the Lord and began to look at the circumstances around him. Why did you doubt? Jesus asked him. This word translated doubt carries the meaning of the standing uncertainty at two ways. Peter started out with great faith, but ended up with little faith because he saw two ways instead of one. We must give Peter credit for knowing that he was sinking and for crying out to the Lord for help. He cried out when he was beginning to sink and not when he was drowning. Perhaps this incident came to Peter's mind years later when he wrote in his first epistle, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. In the New Testament, the first letter to Peter from Peter is chapter 3, verse 12. This experience was difficult for Peter, but it helped him to grow in his knowledge of himself and the Lord. The storms of life are not easy, but they are necessary. They teach us to trust Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone and to obey his word no matter what the circumstances may be. It has well been said, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequences. And he will see me through. If Jesus says, come, then the word is going to accomplish its intended purpose, since he is the author and finisher of our faith. Whatever he starts, he completes. We may fail along the way, but in the end God will succeed. Jesus and Peter walked on the water together and went to the ship. Peter's experience turned out to be a blessing to the other disciples as well as to himself. When they saw the power of Jesus Christ in conquering and calming the storm, they could only fall down and worship him. When Jesus calmed the first storm, Matthew 8, 27 the disciples said, What manner of man is this? But now their clear testimony was, You are the Son of God. The disciples had helped to feed 5,000 people, and then God permitted them to go through a storm. In the book of Acts, they won 5,000 people, and then the storm of persecution began. No doubt, Peter and the disciples recalled their storm experience with the Lord and took courage. This miracle magnifies the kingship of Jesus Christ. In fact, when Matthew wrote Peter's request, Bid me to come, he used a Greek word that means the command of a king. Peter knew that Jesus Christ was king over all nature, including the wind and the waves. His word is law, and the elements must obey. The ship landed at Gennesaret, near Capernaum, and Bethsaida, and there Jesus healed many people. Did these people know that he had come through a storm to meet their needs? 
Do we remember that he endured the storm of judgment to save our souls? He endured the storm for us that we might never face the judgment of God. We ought to imitate the disciples. Bow at his feet and acknowledge that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Here are some questions for your personal reflection or for group discussions. How did Jesus respond to Jesus the Baptist's murder? How did Jesus respond to the needy multitudes of people who followed him? Little is much if God is in it. How is that an encouragement to every Christian to serve the Lord? How are Christians today often like Jesus? Disciplined uh, disciples when they saw the needs of the people around them. How is the story of Jesus in the storm and picture of the church today? What is Jesus doing for us in heaven? How should this give us courage to do his will? And how did Jesus walking on the water help his disciples? How do we recognize Jesus? And how did the disciples recognize him? And what was the purpose of the storm that the disciples went through? What is the storm that you go through? How do they help you as grow as Christians? <laughs> God's blessings to all of you. Bye.